Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, a year or so ago, uh, Stephen Tyler came out with a book entitled, uh, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? And in it, in a footnote, was mentioned uh, a lady's name who, uh, turns out, um, had his biological child that was aborted. And it's quite a story. Um, the lady's name is Julia Holcomb. And this happened about 38 years ago. And uh, we have Julia in studio with us. She's come all the way from Texas via the nice, cool summer lakes of uh, New Hampshire. And uh, we're going to have Julia tell her story of how she met Stephen, how she grew up, how she met Stephen, how it was that they uh, uh, lived together for three years, and uh, the subsequent abortion that occurred right here in the city of Boston, and, um, and everything else that goes along with it. And then of, uh, in a, we're going to do a two-part series. Uh, the second part will talk about the event, and then also uh, the redemptive nature of how she's uh, led her life since then. So welcome, Julia Holcomb. Thank you for having me, Brendan. Julia, I, I'd like to ask you, first of all, how is it that you came to uh, speak out about uh, this situation? Many years, uh, you've kept this quiet to yourself for many years. How did you come to speak out about it? Uh, it's not something I ever expected to speak about in a public way. I had been silent about it throughout my married life. I have six beautiful sons and a daughter, and I had never told my children about my relationship with Stephen or my abortion. It was something that had caused me a great deal of grief, and I didn't want them to carry that same burden. So I had remained silent. Stephen made it public in his book, his first book that he wrote, but he left my name out, so I felt like I didn't have to answer it. In his second book, when he became an American Idol judge, he mentioned me. And after that, Star Magazine wrote an article where they mentioned my name, and they used a photograph of me, and my oldest son saw it, read the article, and recognized his mother. And I had to give my first silent no more talk at home in my living room with my children. And we shed a lot of tears that night. It was very difficult. My children were very loving and forgiving of me. When they heard about my past, they were very surprised and shocked. But they, um, I remember I had one that was a senior in high school that year, and he was about to graduate. He's a big six-foot-two boy, red-headed wrestler, and he came up, threw his arms around me, and he said, Mom, I love you and I forgive you. And I knew at that point that I could be silent no more. I wanted to make sure that I let uh, people know that I, with all my heart, I regretted this abortion and that I wanted to let people know that God had been a pathway for healing. God had taught me to embrace life and become a guardian of life and that that's possible for other post-abortive women as well. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly, uh, I'd like to go back and take a look first at uh, in the environment that you grew up, which uh, perhaps you could tell us uh, your family growing up, what you remember, and, and things of that nature. Could you tell us something about that? We had a very difficult family background. My father abandoned my mother when I was just a toddler. I don't remember my father being at home. I remember the first time I saw him, he came to visit, and he brought a puppy with him. And he spent the day, and it was like heaven that day that Daddy was there, and I was thrilled. But at the end of the day, he said he had to go buy a pack of cigarettes, and he didn't come home. I don't remember how long it was before I saw him again. But my mother and he finally divorced, and she remarried a man who was an alcoholic and an atheist. And, you know, she was an ideal mother at that time. She had been a school teacher. She took us to church, she prayed with us, and I remember that she tithed faithfully. But after that second divorce, she was very disillusioned and broken in her, she just changed. She made a decision to stop attending church. And it's hard to imagine that a decision like that could change your life so dramatically, but it was as if she walked away from God and our family just changed. So the second marriage, the, the fellow was an alcoholic. The first marriage, he, it, he was a gambler and a womanizer. Yes, he was. And, and then your mother, after the second marriage, she had a nervous breakdown. Is that correct? She did. She, she, had a, she just kind of 
walked away from her faith. And mm -hmm. after that, she didn't remarry my second stepfather right away. They just lived together. And our life became very unsupervised. And I felt that I almost didn't have a place where I belonged anymore. I was in the way at home. And I met a girl who had access to backstage parties. Mm -hmm. And I was just uh, almost 16 when I met her. Well, let me ask you one other thing first, though. You had a tragic car accident in your family's life. What, how did that come in? How did that fit in the picture? Well, my grandparents, my, was it, my grandmother was a first grade, my first grade teacher. She was a sweetest woman, and she took us camping with my grandfather at Crater Lake. We spent two weeks there. It was, mm. it was probably one of the happiest memories of my youth. But on the way home from that camp out, we were in a car wreck. My grandfather had a heart attack at the driver's wheel, mm. and my brother was killed. And I woke up in a hospital. And um, you and you had one other sibling. My and... sister was in the car accident as well. And so your your brother was he the middle or the youngest? Or he the was the youngest. He was and the he youngest. He was just ten years old, and he died in that car accident. And just how old, on the way to the how hospital. old were you? I was about 13. About 13. And your older sister? She was uh, 16 months older than I was. She was. And so that uh, car accident helped fuel the... It did. It, it was just a, a lot of tragedies all at once for my mother to bear. And she, um, you know, she was just grieving and broken. Her spirit mm -hmm. was... She had been through a lot of difficulties and I think she just kind of gave up mm -hmm. and felt like she didn't... She almost, I think she just lost her faith for a while. She lost her way. Mm -hmm. And it was at a difficult time for me because I was a teenager. And, mm -hmm. and that's when I met this young woman. And this young woman that you met, what uh, did she lead you into rock and roll or something? Or what she the... sure did. Uh, she, was, she was older than I was. And she told you, me that... You if, were 15 at the time. I was 15. I wasn't allowed to go with her to a concert until my 16th birthday, which was just one month before I met Stephen. And that was, was that your mother's rule or was that... No, it was because of the law. The like law. She would have taken me if the laws would have allowed me to go, but because in, of the law. In I, Portland, In Oregon. Portland, yes. This, uh, uh -huh. she, she was going to concerts a lot, and she would take young girls with her, and uh, I was invited to go. At that age, I was too foolish to understand the danger that I was in. I just thought it was exciting. I knew that I idolized Aerosmith and Steven Tyler. I'd, I'd seen his picture on his album cover. I'd listened to the song Dream On, and when she told me that I could go to the Aerosmith concert, I thought, this is fabulous. I wanted to go, and I hoped that I would meet Steven. And when we met, it was like my world just came to a stop, and we just... Something happened between the two of us. We, I, I went home with him. No one asked where I was at my, my home. I, my supervision was just not there. My mother allowed me to travel with him. And within a few months, I was moved to Boston and living with Stephen. And you were living in uh, Brookline on Beacon Street. Is that correct? Uh... The first apartment we had was in, on Beacon Street, but it wasn't the Brookline apartment. It was in, yeah, it was a different place, but it was a small little basement apartment. And I, I moved there with Stephen, and we had been there for a short time, and he came to me and told me that he needed to become my legal guardian so that I could travel with him and tour. I didn't really understand what all of that meant. Yeah. Why would he do that? What, what, was it because you were, that at that point, you were 16 years old, is that correct? Yes, I was barely 16. He wanted to take me on tour with him, and mm -hmm. he told me that it was illegal for me to cross state lines unless he was my guardian and I was his ward. I didn't think my mother would sign the papers, um, but he came to me very shortly after that, and he had the papers signed. And I remember almost being devastated. I felt kind of abandoned. and By, by uh, your mom? By my mom. And I felt... I wasn't sure what it meant because I knew we weren't married, but I was, uh, he was like a parent to me, and yet we were in a relationship together. And I wondered how it would all turn out. I felt very vulnerable. It, he, I asked him, how did you get her to sign those papers? And he said, I told her that I needed them for you to go to school. And, you know, I didn't go to school. I toured with him. I remember 
sitting on the side of the stage and listening to Stephen sing and and just traveling with the band and mm. I remember thinking I was I was fortunate and that um, I just how many how many girls get to travel with a rock star right I, I I was I was young enough and and uh, foolish enough to think that that this was a, a fortunate situation I didn't realize that I would be taking a path that would take me to the brink of death and that I would be lucky to survive and that I would have um, it end in tragedy. Mm -hmm. So now you were touring all around the, the country um, and uh, there was a, at some point uh, um, S Stephen um, uh, started talking to you about having a child with you is what, what was that how did that all come about and what uh... I was taking the birth control pill when we were first together and we had visited his family's resort in New Hampshire it was near Lake Sunapee and they had a little resort mm -hmm. and we had spent some time there and it had inspired in Stephen a desire to have a family because he began speaking with me about having a child and I thought that was wonderful I I was convinced in my mind that he must truly love me if he wanted to have a baby with me. I loved children. I remembered my cousins, and I said, yes, I would love to have a baby. He uh, threw my birth control pills out the window of the hotel that we were staying at. And looking back at it, I, I, I sometimes have wondered, why did he toss them out the window? And I wonder if it was just so they wouldn't be in the room the next day to rethink that decision. But we became open to life in our relationship at that point. And I didn't get pregnant right away, but within about a year, I became pregnant. And how old were you when that decision was made, when he threw the... Were you 17 by then, or...? I'm not sure. I was probably close to 17, mm -hmm. but I may still have been just 16. Mm -hmm. I, it, I don't remember it being very long after I came before I was off the pill. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I personally wonder whether um, being a ward uh, and having sex, if that would be statutory rape or not, get it from state to state, I know the law, there are different ages state to state, but... Uh, I'm sure that there were um, illegal things about our relationship. But nobody was asking Stephen those hard questions. He was very wealthy and, and famous. People loved him everywhere we went. And he just didn't get a lot of, um, he wasn't asked to answer for, for those things. A lot of tough questions. So then um, you, um, you went up to New Hampshire uh, to meet his parents and I guess his grandmother, is that correct? And After I became pregnant, he told me that we would marry. and. He said that we needed to marry because of um, I was his ward and I had become pregnant. I didn't care why he wanted to marry me. I just knew that I loved him and I was excited about the wedding. I thought my life couldn't get better. I was going to marry Stephen and we were going to have a family and this was wonderful. When we told his parents about our decision to marry and about um, the situation I was in expecting a baby, they were understandably concerned. His father was a very serious man. He spoke to Stephen privately about his displeasure in our situation, and he made it clear to us that it wasn't something that he was supportive of. His mother was very sweet. I remember admiring and loving her. She thought we would have a hard time, but that we would just have to get through it, that we would face it one day at a time. and. He asked his grandmother if she would give us her ring to marry with. She was very old and frail, and she was um, in failing health. And he was the oldest son of an Italian family, and he asked her for her ring. And she looked at us, and she didn't think we looked like a very good bet. Um, she said that if we divorced, the ring would leave the family, and um, she declined. That night was very difficult. I remember leaving the house with Stephen and we argued over a ring. I remember telling him that we should just go and get a ring at a store and get married and things would be fine. And He had had a change of heart and I could see that that wasn't going to happen. We were just kind of in limbo. I didn't really know where it would all end, but I could see that I had 
I was not going to be the one to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So he had uh, second thoughts when he was somewhat rejected by his grandmother and father, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, uh, rejecting your relationship, uh, um, a potential I, marriage relationship. I think perhaps he had had it in his mind that I would stay there with them while I was pregnant. And I don't think that was something that they were ready to take on a responsibility like that. I'm not, I'm not sure everything that, that was discussed, but I could tell that, that his, uh, his discussions with them didn't go like he had hoped. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so you were pregnant, and it's the fall of 1975, and you're staying on Beacon Street in Brookline, uh, not far from here, right, the studios. And, uh, and uh, tell us what happened uh, while you were there. Why were you there, and was he there with you, or was he on the road, or what? what we came uh, back together, and, you know, we had had some arguments after the, after the trip, to, the New trip Hampshire. to Hampshire, and he made the decision to to go on the road and leave me behind. I was very young still. I was, I had no car, no driver's license. I had dropped out of high school to tour with him, so I had no education. I had no money of my own, and he left me to travel on the road, and there was just a little bit of food in the house. After He would call every day, and he would just check on me, see how I was doing. And after the food ran low, I remember telling him I needed to go grocery shopping, and he told me he would send uh, a friend that had worked for the band and had one time been a band member, Ray Tobano, would come to the house and take me grocery shopping the next day. And I hadn't been out of that apartment in weeks, so I was excited. And I, there was a little window that was looking over the street. And I remember waking up early, getting ready, and sitting by the window waiting for Ray to come. And I, I remember watching him walk up the stairs and I remember letting him into the apartment. And I don't remember perfectly, with perfect clarity, everything that happened, but I did wake up in a fire. In a fire? We did not go grocery shopping. I don't know. Ray was gone when I woke up, and the apartment was filled with smoke. I was laying on a sofa, and I was choking. I could hardly breathe. There was so much smoke. I couldn't see anything in the room but smoke. I stood up. And I tripped over a table that was in front of the, the couch, and I fell on the floor. And on the floor, there was more air. It was down low, and I could breathe. And I made the decision uh, to kind of run crawling on the floor to uh, the front door. And when I got there, it was locked. There were several bolts on the doors. Now, and now, you would normally open that door, right? There I was, had opened it to let Ray into the apartment. There was a apartment. key lock, a deadbolt, and then... There was also a bar lock that would normally just slide out of the way. Stephen had a lot of locks on the apartment because he had kept drugs in that apartment. And he wanted to have an opportunity to have the door open slowly if somebody like the police came. And so there were a lot of locks on that door, and the bar lock wouldn't move. I couldn't get it to budge. I. I knew that I had to get out of the apartment very quickly, so I started crawling on the floor to the back stairway. There was a stairway that led down to a kitchen, and there was another exit out that way. Out the back of the apartment? Yes. Mm -hmm. When I got to the stairs, there was smoke and flames on the stairs, and I couldn't get down the stairs, and I knew that I wasn't going to get out of that apartment. And I remembered a public service announcement that I had seen, and it said, learn not to burn, and it talked about staying down on the floor, and it had said that if you're caught in a fire and you can't get out, take refuge in an empty fireplace and open the flue because you can get some air. There was a fireplace in our bedroom, and the flue was already open when I got to it. It was clean. We'd never had a fire in it. And I just crawled there and collapsed in that fireplace. And I can remember the smoke just churning up that chimney and laying there realizing that I was about to die. And I was very frightened. I knew that I was not prepared to die. I felt that I deserved to go to hell. I understood that I had committed very many grave sins. And I was frightened. Over that fireplace was a picture of Jesus. And it was one that had belonged to my grandmother. It was a picture mm -hmm. called The Light of the World. 
And now that's a famous artist, isn't it? Yes, uh, Charles Chambers. Charles that. Chambers, yeah. When my grandmother taught school, that picture had been in every classroom, and every teacher was allowed to pray in school at that time. And she would open the day in prayer. And she, I remember seeing her standing under that picture and opening up the class in prayer. Mm -hmm. um, over time, they were told to take those pictures down. And my grandma was like the last one to do it because she had been there a long time. She was old. The principal allowed her to, to keep it up in the room longer than the mm -hmm. other teachers. But when she retired, he told her to take it home with her. And she did. When she died, it came to me, and it had always been um, something I treasured, and it reminded me of her. and A family heirloom. Kind of, in a way. Mm -hmm. It was like an heirloom to me. And it reminded me of Jesus at that moment when I was facing death. It reminded so, me that he was merciful and that I should pray for mercy. And I remembered the words that when, my, when I was a little girl, if I was naughty, my grandmother made me memorize Bible verses. And if I could memorize the verse, I was forgiven. And mm -hmm. one of the verses I remembered was the words Jesus spoke on the cross. He said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. And those words came to me at that moment. I prayed them like a prayer. And I, felt, I thought of it as a prayer for mercy. And at that moment, I felt peaceful that I didn't expect to live, but I wasn't frightened anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's something. So um, you're here talking to me 38 years later. and. Uh, well, what happened then? You're in a fire in this apartment, and uh, did the Brookline Fire Department respond, or what, what happened? They must have. Well, a very brave fireman pulled me out of that fireplace, and I was near death. I th um, I've read that they had to revive me. I woke up in a hospital, and I was okay. The doctors had thought that if I survived, I would be brain damaged because I had had so much smoke inhalation. But I was fine. I was able to answer the questions. And Stephen was there in the hospital. And how, how many days later was this? Because he was on the road. Did he come right back, or did he? Uh... He he came back soon. I don't know how long I was in the hospital before I woke up. I woke up in the hospital, and I had been unconscious for some time. Mm -hmm. and when I woke up, um, I was very sick for quite some time. I remember falling back asleep. And I don't know how much time went by before I woke up again. And at, at more, as more time went by, I began to strengthen, and I was allowed to, uh, I was told that I would be able to go home. But before I could get out of that hospital, Stephen came to me and told me that I was going to have an abortion. And I had never considered having an abortion. It was something that I was, I had just never dreamed of having an abortion. I wanted my baby with all my heart. And I was looking forward to having my baby. And I remember just telling him, no, that would not happen. And well, let's, let's do this. Let's, um, uh, we're at the end of this particular show. So we'll, okay. we'll start up the second show. You're in the hospital, and he is asking you to have an abortion, Stephen Tyler. And um, I had uh, one or two questions before that, though. Uh, okay. Uh, just quickly, um, were your lungs okay and the baby's lungs okay? Uh, what, I had what, had, the, what did the doctor tell you that was tending to you? The doctor who was taking care of me, he told me that my lungs were remarkably clear and that he was surprised um, that I was in the state of health that I was. Mm -hmm. I asked him how my baby was, and he told me the baby's heartbeat sounded good and that it was fine and that I should be okay. Mm -hmm. And... So he was a very kind and comforting doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll be back uh, with uh, part two of uh, Julia Holcomb's story. Uh, we're in the hospital, and uh, uh, Stephen Tyler has now broached the question, would you have an abortion to Julia after she has just woken up uh, and, and getting her, her uh, faculties together as far as uh, surviving a fire? We've been speaking with Julia Holcomb, who was the ward and biological mother of uh, Stephen Tyler's aborted child. 
and the story is quite compelling. Uh, Julia was in a, a, uh, a fire on Beacon Street, an apartment on Beacon Street in Brookline, Mass. Uh, she woke up in the hospital. The doctor had, in the last show, had said that she, her lungs looked good and her baby looked healthy. And uh, Stephen Tyler was sitting beside her. He came back from being on the road. He was sitting beside her when she woke up. And then, Julia, what happened? Well, well, before I could leave the hospital, Stephen came to me and told me that he had made the decision that I was going to have an abortion. And I was devastated. I didn't understand how he could even talk to me about something like that, as if it was decided for me. I don't really know how far along I was in my pregnancy because I had never received any prenatal care. Stephen hadn't allowed me to have a pediatrician, I mean a doctor, uh, OB an OBGYN, a gynecologist, look at me because um, I was his ward and I was pregnant. He didn't want me to answer questions. So I don't really know how far along I was, but I, I knew that I wanted my baby and I was not willing to have an abortion. I told him no. And we began to argue. He had lawyers there at the hospital. He had... So are you in a hospital bed at the time? I was still in the hospital. I was still just barely recovered from the fire. And he had another doctor who was there and was had told me that he said that this other doctor was going to perform the abortion, that the doctor who had seen me before was not going to do it, but he had a different doctor to do the abortion. I told him no, that I would not have an abortion. And, you know, sometimes we think in the United States that coerced abortions only happen in places like China. But the truth is, coerced abortions happen everywhere abortion is legal. And frequently, I mean, there have been over 55 million abortions in the United States. And of those abortions, over 60% involve coercion. When a woman finds herself an expectant mother, she has to be put in a position frequently where she has to defend her right to have her child and to become a mother. And that's the position I was in. Stephen did not want me to have the baby, and he knew that it was now or never, and he was going, he, he used all of his power and wealth to bring about that abortion. And we argued about it for hours. I told him no. In, in the hospital? In the hospital. Yeah. In the end, he placed the decision. I mean, at, at, after we had argued about it for some time, we just got to the point where we couldn't even look at each other. Abortion is so divisive, it just destroys families. It takes the life of an innocent baby. It leaves mothers and fathers wounded and grieving. And, you know, we hadn't even had the abortion yet, but we were already just, you know, separated because of his asking me to have that abortion. But And, and insistence. He basically... It, the decision was either I could have that abortion or I could hit the street. You know, maybe my mother would take me back. I didn't know. I, at that point, I was terrified. I just gave in out of fear and desperation. I didn't know what would happen to me, and I didn't know how I would take care of a baby. I had no, I had no prospects. I felt like I had no power. You had no money. You were here in Boston. Your mother is out in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, they were. And and she's on to her that would be your second stepfather yes but and and uh, w would she also try to influence you to have an abortion do you think or at that point you were what 18 years old or 17 I was 17 or 18 and I was afraid to go home I I had I had heard my mother speak about abortion in a way that made me fearful of how she would respond if I came home pregnant and I I just felt like I had nowhere to turn and at that point I I just caved in and I just said yes. And that was where the worst nightmare began because that abortion was a late-term saline abortion. And it was just a nightmare. They took me into a, they moved me to another place, either part of that hospital or another hospital, I'm not sure. I do know that I was moved from the ward I was in. And I wasn't really told what to expect. I was taken into this room. I was naked. Stephen was there. There was the doctor was beside me. I didn't I didn't see what he was holding in his hand, but he told me, hold very still, or you could be killed or injured. And I remember just freezing in fear and thinking, what did what does he mean? And before I could even ask him the words what he meant, he had 
taken a large needle and stabbed my uterus with it and punctured my uterus. And I remember just gasping in shock and disbelief. And they began injecting saline into my uterus. And and, and the salt uh, takes away, uh, it basically chokes off the oxygen, is that it? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I've, I've studied about it a little bit since then, and I believe yeah. it, it's, uh, it's what the saline kills the baby. And right. I was told that, I was told it's not a baby, it's a fetus. It's, uh, it's, and they told me immediately after they had punctured my uterus that, had, that my baby was no longer living and that they would move me to another part of the hospital and that the babies, uh, that the fetus would be delivered. I was in labor for many hours and when the baby began to be delivered, they put me under, they gave me a shot and I uh, went to sleep. And I woke up and it was over. But I felt just like something inside of me had died after that abortion. I, I didn't recover very quickly emotionally or um, I was just grieving inside. And Stephen took me to New Hampshire within about a few months of the abortion to recover. He felt that it would um, can help I, me. Can I ask you something? Uh, one of the uh, things you mentioned uh, is that after they had given you the saline injection, Stephen was there beside you doing lines of cocaine? At, at, while I was in labor, he was doing drugs in that, ho in that hospital room. I remember it, he even offered drugs to me at one point, and I was so sick, and I didn't accept them. I remember turning away from him just sad inside and grieving that this was what my life had become like. I, I couldn't believe that these things were even happening. It's, it almost becomes surreal when your life gets this ugly. And I was so young and I hadn't really experienced um, goodness in a long time. It, it just almost seemed like this was normal. And like I said, I withdrew. I became very withdrawn. I'd always been very cheerful and happy. And after that abortion, I became very quiet and withdrawn. And then Stephen took me to New Hampshire. We were out in a Jeep, and we were um, riding and driving through the countryside. And I remember starting to feel better, and he began to speak to me about the abortion. And um, I think he wanted to kind of get it off of his chest. And that is when he told me that the baby had been born alive and that it had either been allowed to die. He didn't finish his sentence because as soon as he started saying it had been born alive, I reacted to his words by crying and asking him how could that be true, how could it be born alive, and, and if it was born alive, how could they not help it? How could it not have been offered aid in... He realized at that point that he had said too much and that he began to try to comfort me with the words um, that I shouldn't think about it anymore, that it couldn't be changed at this point, it was over and done with, and that his words, they still haunt me. It, he said, we did the right thing. And I remember thinking, how could anyone say that that was the right thing to do? We had, what we had done was wrong. It had taken the life of our child and it left the two of us grieving. Stephen, in his own words later in his book, used the words, Jesus, what have I done, to describe his feelings after that abortion. And certainly, any post-abortive parent feels like that. Jesus, what have I done? How do, how do I go on with my life from this point? And I'll tell you, it's, uh, there is recovery to be had, but it begins with repenting. It begins with acknowledging that this is wrong. Abortion is not pro-woman. Abortion is violence against a woman. It's a, it takes the life of a baby, and it's violence against the family. And that was my experience of it. A lot of times you hear the pro-choice side saying that, that abortion is pro-woman. I don't think anything could be further from pro-woman than abortion. Abortion is, is something that is like a war on woman. Uh, it's a war against her fertility, against the family, and my uh, women who experience abortion do not come away from it with a positive attitude about it.
Mm -hmm. Now, I know we've had on here um, Dr. Teresa Burke, and uh, she tries to help post a board of women because of all of the multitude of issues that come up, uh, uh, how, how the women react to their abortion. Uh, she sees certain patterns. She has a, a wonderful book called Forbidden Grief. Yeah. Uh, that uh, I'm in the process of reading, and it's, uh, gosh, it's something that I'd recommend to every person out there to read this particular book by Dr. Theresa Burke. Well, now, you're, so how much longer were you with Stephen then? You were with him a total of three years. How much longer after that uh, discussion were you with him, and did you go back to the West Coast, or were you still on the East Coast? Or? You know, our relationship was altered after that abortion, but I didn't go home right away. Um, it was within about a year I returned home, and when I did get home, I was surprised because things were better than they had been when I left. My mother had married my stepfather, my second stepfather. Mm -hmm. They now had a child, and he was about two years old when I got home. They had returned to church for his sake. They had started attending a church again, and you know they still had a ways to go in their conversion, but they were, had begun the process. And my mother invited me to go to a church camp. She could see that I was really uh, hurting inside when I got home. I think I had read that you'd had many a sleepless night. And, uh... I, oh, I, I could not sleep at night. I would wake up dreaming of the fire and of that abortion. I remember sleeping at night with my Bible open. And I remember I knew that I would wake up and when I did, I could read the Psalms, and it would comfort me, and I would be able to get back to sleep. My mother invited me to go to this church camp. It was at the Oregon coast, and it was a, a week-long camp. And I didn't really even want to go at first. I was, I was still very um, cynical, kind of bitter and proud. And, but I did like the beach, and I did want to go to the beach, so I went with them. And, but when I got there... That was where God took a hold of my life. I met young people my own age, and I hadn't been around anybody uh, my own age in years, and they were so different than I was. They were so kind, and they were you know, very humble. They would meet in the mornings and pray together. And I remember sitting outside by the campfires on the beach and reading the Bible together, and by the time I left that camp, I could see that they had something I needed, something I didn't have. They had Jesus in their hearts. And I made the decision to ask Jesus into my life. And that's where my, my journey really began, where I feel like I, I was, my life began anew. I'm, mm -hmm. That old Julia was just gone, and I became a different person. When I got back home, I had to first make a lot of changes. I had to, I had to break off old friendships. I had to find a church. I was baptized, and I began attending church. I went to college, and in college, the pastor of the church I went to encouraged me to memorize Bible verses. And I remembered my grandmother being an advocate of Bible verses. So I, uh -huh. I thought, you know, I needed some help, I was going to listen to that pastor and do what he said. And he said, start with Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's the Sermon on the Mount. It's like mm -hmm. a mini catechism. And I began memorizing five, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, it changed who I was. It began to form my conscience, and I began to understand right and wrong. I made the decision to become uh, celibate and live a chaste life and... I just, my whole life changed, and that's when I met my husband. And my husband and I have been married for over 30 years, and mm -hmm. I love him more now than I did when we met. And we have a wow. beautiful family. We have that's... seven beautiful children. I have six sons and a daughter. And I just feel so thankful that God, in his goodness, um, could help me to recover and rebuild my life by embracing life as a gift. And you had mentioned um, Terry Burke. Uh, what, what is Kevin that? Burke. Oh, pardon me, yeah. Kevin Burke, who... 
happens to be married to Teresa Burke. Teresa Burke, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how did that all fit in? How did he come into picture as far as um, advancing when... your coming on Pre, you know, uh, coming on television today or, or your um, Silent No More ministry? I read Kevin's article um, entitled, Jesus, What Have I Done?, where he um, wrote about a father's grief over abortion. Sometimes we think only of a mother's grief, and certainly that's you know where it begins. But also, abortion affects families, and there's a, always a, a father in there somewhere. And he was writing about it from Stephen's perspective, even though Stephen didn't... Um, he didn't say that he he wouldn't fully acknowledge that the abortion was a wrong decision. He did talk about his regret for the abortion in the words, Jesus, what have I done? And Kevin wrote about that. I read his article and I responded to it in a letter. And I made the decision that I was going to, if I had had to tell my children about this relationship I'd had with Stephen and about my abortion, that I was going to find the courage to go out there and hit the street and get out in front of our local Planned Parenthood in Houston with a sign, a Silent No More sign, that says, I regret my abortion, and encourage other women who are post-abortive to look for healing. And so I would like to encourage any other women who might be watching this program, if they have had an abortion and have not had an opportunity to go through a healing um, retreat like Rachel's Vineyard, there's... You can get on the silentnomoreawareness.org website, and you can click on it. You can register your regret. You can do it anonymously. No one will know it, who you are. And you can find out about healing ministries in your area, and that's uh, something I encourage you to do. I know Kevin encouraged me to make a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, and Brad and I, my husband and I, went on that retreat together. He, my husband's never participated in an abortion in any way. But he came along with me on my retreat just as a support to help me through my retreat. And it was very, very helpful for me to have him there. And it helped him also to find healing because if you are in a relationship with someone who's post-abortive, that abortion affects you as well. And he had a lot of anger that he needed to find a way to forgive people who had been involved in coercing me to have that abortion and he had to, to be able to forgive, just like I had to be able to ask God to forgive me and accept that forgiveness so that I could be the mother that I'm called to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this, uh, just a, a second, uh, that second book, um, uh, Stephen Tyler still uh, is uh, exhibiting some things. He's saying some things about you that aren't true. Is that correct? Uh, like I had read several things that, you you deny that they what his assertions uh, in, that he wrote in his book. Well, he he has his his way of describing me and our relationship, and it certainly was very demeaning the way he described um, you know me. And he he began by saying that I had had other pregnancies and other abortions, and that was very painful. That was not true. I had, our relationship, the child that I can see with Stephen was my first pregnancy. It was, I had never had an abortion before. I had never even the thought of having an abortion, and it was very painful for to read him say in writing that I had had previous pregnancies or abortions. That was a, not true in any way. It was a lie, and I wanted to make sure that my children understood what the truth was. And I want to make sure that my children understood with, that with all my heart I regret my abortion, that, that their brother, I, when I went on my Rachel's Vineyard retreat, I gave the baby a name. He was a boy and his name is Michael. Mm -hmm. And his life has great value and importance and every baby is has great value and importance and every child that's been lost through abortion is is a is a huge loss for our nation, for our country. And I hope that we can find the courage to keep fighting and change our nation's laws so that we can protect life. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that um, the Silent No More awareness organization is growing? Uh, is, it, is it really being effective? Uh, I, I know that it started in the Pittsburgh area, I believe, the yeah. ladies from Pittsburgh. It is. It, I've just only been involved for the last two years, and 
I was able to go to the March for Life in Washington, D.C. the last two years, and I'll tell you, that is a moving experience. I was amazed at how huge the it presence is. at the March for Life is. There's just hundreds of thousands of people at that March for Life. And, and the national media won't cover it. They don't cover it. They and won't cover it. So it's surprising when you see how large. And it's large, in January. And it is. It, it's <laughs> freezing cold. But And they're young people. They're people which shows that this movement, we really are winning. And it was very humbling to be at the March for Life carrying a sign that says, I regret my abortion. But I got out there with the other Silent No More women, and we marched to the steps of the Supreme Court, and we tell our stories there on the Supreme Court, and we ask for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade and change our nation's laws to protect life. If if uh, if we keep growing like this, pretty soon there'll be, you know, that we'll be winning this. We'll be winning. I know that uh, popular opinion is is changing, and we are uh, winning. Although maybe in this state they haven't figured it out yet, but we we keep trying. I, I one thing I've noticed when I travel around the country, and I've met a lot of a lot of women in the pro life movement are post abortive. They are. That's correct. And yeah. I encourage any woman out there if you're. If you're post-abortive, sometimes it can be a scary thing to get involved in the pro-life movement. But I encourage you to become active. And it's a very healing thing to do, is to get out there and try to be a part of the solution. And that's what I'm trying to do. And I encourage any other women who are post-abortive to get involved, get active. Well, Julia, we really appreciate your coming on the show and uh, coming from such a great distance. Uh, hopefully you've picked up on your frequent flyer miles doing so. And uh, uh, hopefully our paths will cross again. But we want to thank you so much for coming on Life Matters today and sharing your story. And hopefully we'll get that story out there for you. Okay. Thank you. Great thank to you. have you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Life Matters. We'll see you next week for another uh, exciting show. Take care.